Ann Willis Tucker holds degrees from Randolph Macon Women's College and the Rochester Institute of Technology and a postgrad degree from the Visual Studies Workshop, a division of the State University of New York. After working at various museums and universities, she joined the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in 1976 and is currently the Dustin Lindell Wortham Curator. She founded the museum's photography department and now has, which now actually holds 28,000 photographs. Tucker has curated over 40 exhibitions, most of which were accompanied by a publication. She has contributed essays to monographs and catalogs and has published numerous articles. She's lectured throughout the US, Europe, Asia, and Latin America, and was a jury member for the selection of the 2009 Jupe Swart Masterclass. Tucker has been awarded fellowships by the National Endowment for the Arts, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, and the Getty Center. In 2001, in an issue devoted to America's Best, Time Magazine honored her as America's Best Curator. She was the first recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Focus Award from the Griffin Museum of Photography in 2006, and received an Alumni Achievement Award from randolph Macon Women's College in 2011, Tucker received an honorary doctorate, doctorate from the college at, at Rockport State University of New York. She recently curated the uh, groundbreaking exhibition, War Photography, Photographs of Armed Conflict and its Aftermath, which features images recorded by more than 280 photographers from 28 nations and spans 165 years over six continents from the Mexican-American War in the mid-1800s to present-day conflicts. Has anyone seen that exhibition? So, yes. So at this time, I would like to uh, welcome Anne Lewis Tucker. connection to our um, bridge program, our academic program. Um, I've always been drawn to uh, interdisciplinary subjects. Um, I always think that um, and in a fine arts museum, interdisciplinary subjects are um, the way to reach your broadest audience. You just don't want people interested in photography coming, but you want people who want to be engaged in the world of ideas. Um, and so I think an exhibition like this one presents so many opportunities for, um, for issues, for discussing issues, which is the heart of what artists do. I am an art historian because my freshman year, um, we took a trip to the National Gallery in Washington, and I had only been to one other art museum and at the time, the New Orleans Art Museum, which was sweetly dusty. Um, and I just walked around the National Gallery awed and said, I don't know what this is, but I want to do this, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was lucky. I had Mary Frances Williams, who was an extraordinary teacher, and I will just tell you, students, that in her exams, you always knew when somebody got to a certain question because they would go, oh. <laughs> and you could just hear it throughout the room. My two favorite questions that she asked, one was, and it was allowed, to uh, trace the evolution of drapery in sculpture from medieval to Baroque with citing special examples. <laughs> My favorite question was, um, Van Gogh dies and is St. Peter gives him his choice of rooming with Vermeer or Rembrandt, which does he choose and why? <laughs> You know, you had to think about it. Um, of course, the question didn't ask whether we needed their them wanted to room. <laughs> she was smarter than that. Interdisciplinary is certainly um, the principal component of this exhibition, and um, the 
the impact of that has surprised us. We just really had no idea that it would be received and um, debated and engaged people on so many levels. Um, veterans, active service, we have a review coming out in the Journal of American History. Um, you know, it, it has reached people in, in ways that we could only hope for and yet are a bit stunned by. It's an exhibition that had three curators, and I think the success of this exhibition largely depends on those three curators, who were myself in my late 60s. Vietnam was my war. I know people who died in the Vietnam War, who chose not to fight in it, who um, I protested against it. I got gas over the Vietnam War. Um, Will Michaels is in his 40s. He's a photographer, so I'm an art historian. Will's a photographer. Um, and um, But he got his initial degree in architecture from Pratt, and for 10 years was the restoration architect on the USS Texas, which was a ship that fought in both World War I. It was initiated for World War I, but in World War II was at both D-Day and at Iwo Jima. And so um, Will, as a way of restoring the battleship, interviewed as many veterans as he could find who ever served on the battleship, asking them, where was the dentist office when you were here? Where was the post office? Where were your quarters? Um, one of the um, interesting puzzles was, of course, in World War II, the Navy was not integrated, and he couldn't find out where the black um, service members' quarters were. Mm -hmm. And finally, a, a black veteran came, and he said, I'll tell you, and he gave Will a heart attack because he was no longer young. He raced down the stairs. He vaulted over the railing. He took four steps, and he said it was right here. Mm -hmm. So he literally used muscle memory mm -hmm. to find those quarters. And when they chipped the paint off, they found where there used to be a door there that had been sealed off in later things. So Will, in talking to the veterans, and one of the things about talking to them about Iwo Jima was they all remembered the flag going up on Mount Suribachi. And so that photograph is critical in this exhibition, which I'll talk about. The third member is Natalie Zelt. And Natalie was an American Studies um, major. We actually went and got her out of graduate school to come back to the museum, and um, her war was Afghanistan because her brother was fighting there. And the importance of this is that, and I'll talk about more of this as we go through the exhibition, but photographs, no art has a set meaning. Everybody has opinions, but every person brings their experiences, their expectations, their feelings, um, their uh, proclivities, and each generation is so different. So having three generations with three different investitures in the subject of war, um, I think enriched the show because no photograph could go in if all three didn't vote for it. So it was lively, the discussions. Um, now it started, um, with this photograph, Joe Rosenthal's photograph of the flag going up on um, Iwo Jima. Um, this is, can you all hear me? I have a fairly convenient having a loud voice. Um, this is Mount Suribachi. Um, it is a place no one in America had ever heard of until this moment. Um, and then suddenly um, we all knew. But, but this is the landing. They're going in on D-Day. Um, the Japanese knew this was the only beach they could land on and um, had all of their guns aimed at the beach. Um, they waited until the third wave was in and on the beach. And Joe Rosenthal, who took both of these pictures, said <coughs> being on the beach and not being hit was like being in the rain and not getting wet. It was so fierce and it's the largest loss of marine service member's life in any one battle. 
Um, so taking Mansuribachi was critically important, both because then the Japanese could not shell from there, but also it was psychologically important. And raising the flag, so a general sent one troop off to raise the flag. And how many of you have heard that this photograph is staged? How many of you? Yes. Not. Um, the first flag was raised, and it was a regular sized flag, and it wasn't large enough. So they got a Navy flag and sent a second larger flag up. Shirbachi was still under sniper fire, and um, it was still dangerous to go up. The thing about Rosenthal, and I don't have the comparison here, but this is not just a snapshot. He built a pile of rocks to stand on before he took the picture, which lowered the horizon line. There's another picture in our exhibition in the catalog where you can see the horizon line cuts here. And you can see what difference that makes in terms of it as a picture. Um, the mistake of people thinking that it's staged is Rosenthal um, had to shoot it quickly. They went up, they started raising the flag more quickly. Now, this picture was taken on a Friday. It was sent to Guam on a Saturday. Guam was the huge um, lab for the whole Pacific where every film and photograph was sent. It was developed there. The censors could rule on whether it could be released. And if it could be released, then it was sent out, the photographs were, not the film, by radio waves. Um, and so it was um, taken on a Friday, developed on a Saturday, and so for Sunday morning, it hit the Sunday papers in the United States. In February 1945, we desperately needed good news. We desperately needed to know that part, the Pacific was a fierce fighting, and so it was a huge um, morale builder, not only for the men fighting on Iwo Jima, the fighting on Iwo Jima went on for another three weeks, and in fact, three men in this group were killed on Iwo Jima, on the fighting, subsequent fighting in Iwo Jima. Um, but this picture in our collection, which we acquired in 2002, which started this whole project, is about that big, because the man who developed the negatives realized that this was a special picture. So even that first person who's only looking at the negative realized that this was a special picture and made a print that he sent home to his family. So as far as we know, this is the first, we have in our collection, the first print from the negative um, of this um, Pulitzer Prize winning and world famous picture. So Will Michaels came to me and he said, um, why don't we collect more photographs? And I said something silly like, because I'm a girl. Um, <laughs> I didn't play with toys, you know, I didn't prior to this, read military books. Um, but I said to him, make a list for me of the photographs we should have in the collection, which he did, and that made us pull out all the books. And we felt that the books were, the existing books on war photography were inadequate. They were either chronological books that said this war happened and these people photographed and then this war happened and these people photographed, etc., like that, or they were World War II or Nam or something, or they were monographs about a famous photographer. But unlike other genres, still life, portrait, landscape, there were no discussions about the genre of war photography. What is it that makes, what's the core of the genre of war photography? So Will and I were, um, and, and one of the other things that, that bothered us is most books about war photography Focus either on the fight or the immediate aftermath. Um, these are two great photographs. One of our pleasures was discovering how many truly superb photographers came from Russia in World War II. Dmitry Volchimitz being one of the greatest. Um, and um, so we really Notice that and logged it in. I'll come back to that. I want to tell you as students something important about this picture. We've known this picture since after the war. It's one of the more famous pictures in the field. Only four years ago, a young professor 
at Colorado got interested in this, uh, in Jewish studies, at Colorado got interested in this picture. And he discovered that these weren't, as it had been promoted, um, a broad range of Russian citizens, but they were all Jews. The retreating Germans brought all the Jewish men in this town of Kersh to this one location and killed them all. And these are the families of those men searching for their loved ones. And through incredible research, because you realize we're doing this 60 years later, he was able to name all the men, name the people in the photograph, and, and it's just an, it, you know, it's one of those pieces of research that just changes our total perception. What he also found was an editor at a newspaper who said, we needed at that time, we needed the support. Russia was mostly um, a, a, an Eastern Front. They never were attacked by the Japanese, so by this time, they, uh, not, shortly after this, the 43, they had pulled the troops that they stationed on the Japanese side, and I mean Western Front, and, and brought them over to the Western Front. Um, but the middle of the country, where, which is the breadbasket of Russia, wasn't being affected, and they needed those people's support. He said, we knew the peasants would, vote, would fight for citizens, but not for Jews. So they consciously changed the caption, written by the photographer. And that's really important to understand in this exhibition, because war photographs are so often propaganda that who writes the caption, what their agenda is, became an important component of our exhibition. One of the things we wanted to do was broaden the understanding that thousands of other photographs, besides fight and death, um, are taken in relation to war. Um, we saw hundreds of pictures of soldiers playing cards. This is one of the earlier ones. Um, and religion. Um, was a very famous um, and very repeated subject um, for the photographers. Um, we also realized that all the books we were looking at, some of them by my very scholarly colleagues, were writing about war photography and they were in fact only writing about journalism. And there is, um, there are four types of war photographers. Um, and why they photograph, what they photograph, how it's distributed are really important. Um, one of the things um, that um, was a big part of our exhibition is um, reconnaissance and documentation from a military point of view. This photograph taken by um, a, a military Navy photographer is widely published as um, the first photograph taken from a submarine of a, of a ship that it has sunk. And the military historians that we were working with said, you can't say that. You don't know what photographs are in military archives that have never been released. You know, so a lot of times in doing the research for this exhibition, we had to change captions. Um, because, and we had to say in the catalog, we know this has been published as blah, 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 but in fact, you know. Um, and then this is a self-portrait that um, a soldier made of himself. Um, the most common photograph taken in wartime is portrait. If you think about it, every person going to war um, wants their image left behind, and that's been possible since the Civil War, a little bit since Crimea. We actually had a photograph in the exhibition from the Mexican-American War, but that was, those all had to be daguerreotypes, so there are very few of those. Um, but from the Civil War on, the most common photograph, these happen to be both of leaders. This is from uh, a portrait of a leader of American, from the Mexican-American War. Uh, and then, of course, Winston Churchill. Um, you all know the story of this picture. Churchill's nickname was the Bulldog, and Karsh wanted that aspect of Churchill. He had three minutes. Churchill was speaking to the Canadian Parliament. He had three minutes to take the picture. Churchill was clearly impatient. He had a cigar in his mouth, and Karsh reached up and grabbed the cigar <laughs> and photographed the Churchill's <laughs> opinion of that gesture. Um, but the photographs are people just, you know, the, 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 who 
went into com either commercial photographs like this one. This was a man at Britain home on leave who made this incredibly poignant photograph of his daughter before he went back into service. Um, and then this is one of the most controversial photographs in the exhibition. Um, this is um, an Iraq veteran who um, has severe um, brain and head injuries and a prosthetic arm. This was his high school sweetheart when he came back from Iraq and went to the Brooks Hospital in San Antonio. She stayed with him the whole time. When they came back to their small town in Ohio, everybody expected them to get married. They were basically pressured by others' expectations, and they really weren't ready. I mean, they were high school sweethearts, but this is a different story. And the marriage only lasted nine months. And I think the photographer, who actually they are in the local commercial portrait studio having their wedding day picture taken, and the journalist is off to the side, capturing this moment where she looks like a deer caught in the headlights, which is what I think she was. Um, the photographer continued to follow her, and tragically, he died in January. Um, he slipped on the sidewalk in the ice, um, and alcohol was involved. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's the other thing about these photographs is the iconic ones continue to have um, a re-understanding of her as history passes. Um, then, of course, photojournalists, Rosenthal's newspaper, what that means is he had daily deadlines, had to get those pictures in by 4 o'clock, or depending on time zone. Um, whereas magazine photographers had either a weekly deadline or a monthly deadline, they could work longer on stories. Um, although, one of the most poignant series in the show is for a newspaper, but they worked on it for months. And it's a story about uh, a Marine officer whose job was to go to the homes of people and tell them that their loved one had been killed. And so this is where he's delivering the belongings. This is the casket coming off the plane. This, was, this is another Pulitzer Prize winning series. But this is the one that just gets me every time, which is the widow wanted to spend the night in the room with the casket watching her recorded Skype interviews with her deceased husband. And the Marines stood guard all night um, and stood by the coffin so that she was not alone. They never look at it without. Snapshots is the most under-researched part of recording of wars. Um, there are thousands of snapshot albums. In fact, we bought this one on eBay. Um, as people are dying, their, their, their photographs are coming online. Um, but this is an African-American soldier who was stationed on Iwo, and it's a wonderful um, album. Um, and this is a young woman, when Germany went into Poland, they took all the Poland, her I mean, German heritage people physically forced them back to Germany, separated the children from the parents, and put them into redoctrination camps. So this photograph, this photograph belongs to her, but the, this is Easter, but if you look carefully, the Easter eggs are in the sign of a swastika. And instead of Christ, it's Hitler um, featured on the table. So, you know, it's an incredible document of a something most of us don't even know occurred. Um, and then artists who were dealing after the war with their 10, 20, 30 years out trying to, to deal with it. This is um, Marcel Rotsky, who lived during the era that disappeared when 30,000 Argentines were killed by the military junta. He was trying to cope with what had happened, so he took his class picture, he circled all the ones who were killed, um, and then wrote the ones who escaped. Like he, he was shot and escaped capture and fled to Spain, but his 18-year-old brother was captured and killed, which I think is part of his impetus to try to deal with it. 
James Nakagawa is photographing the caves in Okinawa where people fled to and many of them were killed either by Japanese soldiers, it's a kind of a long story, I don't want to go. We also wanted to let people know that many journalists and many people died in this situation. So Robert Kappa stepped on a landmine in the Indonesian war, which was the French war um, in Asia. And this is Dickie Chappelle, the only woman photographer on Iwo Jima, photographer in Korea who was killed um, in Vietnam. Technology was another component um, that we discussed throughout the, the catalog. That's the kind of camera that Brady and his photographers used on a tripod. You're not photographing action with that camera. Um, and you wouldn't try to photograph action because if you were standing out with that camera and a tripod, you might as well have a flag saying, shoot here. Um, whereas this is Nikut's famous photograph of Kim Park running from the napalm, which this is the radio machine that would scan this and send it back to the services. And Nick was so certain that he would win the Pulitzer, which he did, he kept the machine and the photograph. Um, so we borrowed the original machine and photographed this for the exhibition. And, um, but this is what the Crimean War. And at that time, you had to have a mobile dark room because you had to make your negative, go out, expose it, come back in, develop it. Um, that was another dangerous thing to be in because people thought it was an ammunition zone um, in a wagon. But then, in terms of transmission, Fitton did all his photographs, then took weeks to sail back to England from the Crimea. And then when he did sail back, you report, they had to be translated into woodcuts because you couldn't yet photograph you couldn't yet reproduce a photograph in that detail, as opposed to Michael um, Brown, whose equipment was damaged on his first day in, in, um, in, in Libya. And so he made the rest of his photographs on a cell phone and became the first photographer that National Geographic published cell phone photographs um, in National Geographic. Um, and of course, the internet has changed everything. One of my absolute favorite stories out of all this is the soldiers, the photographers talk about, they go out on patrol in the morning, they come back, they uplink their photographs to their agency or their newspaper or whatever, with caption and everything. If it's, they're uplinking it to AP, it is immediately um, bounces from the AP mainframe to all the subscribers to AP. And with Google search, any family member can either program in their family member's name or the unit or whatever, and it, you know, they immediately know if a photograph, uh, you know. So, whereas families used to wait days, weeks, months for a letter to wind its way from a soldier at the front, now they get news maybe before the, the serviceman gets it, which has not necessarily all good repercussions for the photographer because it's that the soldiers don't like the photograph. And then they go on an afternoon patrol that complicates their life. My favorite story is the photographer would see this guy, so a serviceman approaching him, and he thought, it's just going to be one of those moments, you know. And the guy goes, my mother saw that photograph. She said, you're smoking? <laughs> <laughs> he said, I wrote her back and I said, mom, the long-term health of of smoking in Afghanistan are really not at the top of the list. <laughs> but what began to happen? So we were very lucky, very lucky. We got two major grants. We had $80,000 in travel grants. And so we did something which is quite sacrilege these days. We decided not to start with a theory or a purpose. We decided not to start with any idea of what we were looking for. And we just started going to archives, Australia, Imperial War Museum in London, National Library of Congress, Quantico Military Base, museums around the world, um, and just looking. Will and I figured we must have looked at over a million photographs, either actual photographs on the web, um, in books, uh, 
you know. Uh, and at night, we would ask ourselves when, when, when we, we were three or two traveling, okay, well, all the photographs you looked at today, what do you remember? What's sticking in your mind? No notes, just what's sticking in your mind. And we would get reproductions of those photographs. So, because from the beginning, because we're a fine arts museum, we wanted strong pictures. They had to be, it could be an illustration, it had to be a strong photograph. <laughs> and then we came back, we got those reproductions, and we came back, and we'd start looking at them, and after, I think, three years of research, we were beginning to see patterns. We were beginning to see recurring subject matter. Every war has a photograph of a woman at a grave. It's just, you know, duh. But, you know, and one of the ones that amused us, I don't care how sophisticated the photographer, if he saw or she saw a line of soldiers perfectly reflected in the water, they took that picture. <laughs> So we started grouping them in this way. Then we applied for a National Endowment for the Humanities Grant, and we invited in military historians, Hillary Roberts from the Imperial War Museum, Jeff Hunt from the Texas Military Forces Museum, um, and others, and they said, look, the categories that you're developing are our concerns when we are planning and executing and writing the history of war. They helped us shape our categories, and that's the point. In the beginning, you saw war, a red slash, and photography. It became a, an exhibition about war and the nature of war, and photography and the nature of photography, and how the two have intersected. Um, the very last thing we did, which actually people thought we did from the beginning, was realize that we could take those categories, which we'd begun to shape, and put them in the order of war. And so it became an exhibition that the audience walked through in the order of conflict um, perceived by photographers over, starting in 1848, and our last picture is from Libya. Um, but photographs of the actual moment of war are very, very rare. Um, photographers just don't happen to be there normally. Um, but this is one of um, for me, another photograph that always gets to me, this is taken by a Japanese airman. These are the torpedoes going into Battleship Row. This is the moment that World War II begins for the United States government. Um, there are 2,000 men um, in these battleships who don't know that they are about to die. They're getting up, it's early Sunday morning, some of them are probably still asleep, or maybe they're going to church, or maybe they're riding a family member. One ship has already been hit, you can see the oil here. Kick on field, they hit the airfield first so the planes couldn't get up, and then they drop the, the torpedo bombs um, into the battleships. This is 9-11, as you all realize, and this is a case where a photographer lived in Brooklyn saw the plane going into, on television, saw the first plane going in, ran up on his roof, used motor drive, um, and photographed the second plane. Here it's approaching, and he continued to photograph until it hit the second tower. He then had to walk from Brooklyn to Time Life in Times Square because all forms of transportation are shut down um, at that moment. I mean, New York, New York subways, taxis, all traffic, everything was shut down. But it, but it appeared, Time usually comes out on a Monday, that magazine came off, and um, by Friday they had the new magazine out that was solely devoted to 9-11. Of course now, even, you know, that's 2001, now I don't even know if they'd make that effort because by then, five days later, it would have been totally covered on the internet and it wouldn't be the same. That's just how fast it's all changing. Then we went to embarkation and um, training. Um, reconnaissance, that's a plane taking off an aircraft carrier in World War II. This is um, Afghanistan, and he is using night vision glasses to look at roads where they might be burying the uh, landmines and IEDs um, in uh, 
The weight is one of, for me one of the more poignant sections because these are people who know they're about to go into battle and we had a whole section on the way. These are um, airmen, pilots who are waiting to be called off on an aircraft carrier um, and these are Sandinistas um, in, in Nicaragua. Um, and so that moment of waiting, that moment of knowing that shortly um, you may or may not come out of this alive. Um, now the fight are the pictures everybody wants and the hardest to get for obvious reasons. Um, so a lot of fight pictures are faked and this is one of the fakes we put in the exhibition. I think <coughs> to most of us now this looks like a toy but for almost 30 years this book, which was supposed to be about World War I dogfights, was totally accepted because people wanted to accept it. They wanted to see photographs of World War I dogfights. Um, only after the photographer died did the wife, the widow, admit that her husband, a stunt coordinator in Hollywood, had done this all with toy model planes and et cetera, and faked this book, which was gone into many printings, and you can still see on eBay where people think this is um, a real picture. That wanting to have it has led, you know, to, to people faking it. We have another in the exhibition where they are not charging the battlefield, they are charging the cookhouse with all the steam coming out. Um, but Robert Kappel was on the front line. He chose to go into D-Day um, on the front. He, he, um, he early in the war decided that if you're if you're going to be in the ceremony, you have to be in the parade. And so he was known, and it eventually cost him his life. But um, it's a famous, very famous picture from World War II because Omaha was the deadliest of the five beaches. Um, all the other photographers' film was gathered and given to one person to take back to England to have it developed. Kappa, because he was going back on that ship, kept his film. All the other film was lost in the handoff from the landing craft to the battleship. So none of the other photographers' photographs of the beginning moments of Omaha Beach survived. Um, Kappa's got to England, but in the anxiety to get the negatives developed, the young lab assistant turned the lab up and it melted the negatives and only 11 negatives survived. So uh, that's why it looks the way it does. Um, but these are instances where, um, these are both two of the most famous photographers, Don McCollum, James Dockway, a generation apart. Um, this is Hue, the, most, the deadliest battle of um, Vietnam. Um, and McCollum is right there. I mean, when you're throwing hand grenades, you're 100 yards away. Um, and McCollum is in a, in a foxhole right there. And um, where you're with a sniper, somebody's snipering him. So these are photographers who are famous for, like Kappa, being right there with the troops that they are photographing. Um, this man's hand was shot, the, actually, two seconds after that picture was taken. Um, the show will be different in Brooklyn as it was in the Corcoran in LA, but in Houston we divided all the segments into their own rooms and if we knew it was going to be a tough subject, the room actually closed, or didn't close, but had a narrower opening so people had some warning. The execution room was really a tough room, is a tough room, because it is difficult for us as human beings to see an unarmed person killed by an unarmed person. It's just hard, you know. Um, if we project ourselves into that moment, you know, it's terrorizing. This is a very famous photograph um, that was published in Life magazine of an Australian airman being um, beheaded by um, a Japanese soldier. And this, um, if any of you saw the Ben Affleck movie uh, about Iraq, it starts with this photograph, um, which is um, where the Shaw's, the, the, the Shaw's people were rounded up, and the day the, 
the Isle Tarnit landed in, um, in Iran, there were hundreds, maybe thousands, really not known, of executions. Um, but we, we know that some of these people were just innocent. They were just rounded up, you know, and there was a trial, but, um, you know. Uh, but it's, it's a normal part. Executions are a normal part. And military historians will talk to you about it just being a tool of war. Um, I don't have here the famous Eddie Adams photograph, which was critical to the American public in the Vietnam War. But if you talk to military historians, they tell you he's doing exactly what he should do. That's the Tet Offensive. Saigon was chaos. There was no front line. There were no behind the lines to take somebody who's a prisoner. There were no extra troops to take, to, to spare, to send to take a prisoner somewhere. Executions like that famous photograph were going on all over Saigon, on both sides. Um, and so um, it, it, it changed my understanding. Rescue, major part of, of any conflict um, with some people risking their lives to save others. Um, Gene Smith from World War II, um, Kim Page from Vietnam. Um, and one of the things that's changed dramatically is our understanding of what in World War I was called the Thousand Yard Stair, um, in World War II was called, and, and Nam was called shell shock, and is now called PTSD. Um, in World War I, it was so misunderstood that hundreds of men were sh executed for cowardice because they couldn't go back into battle. And the British government has actually officially apologized to those families. <coughs> but an interesting component that is just coming out is the photojournalistic field is finally acknowledging that photographers are also highly susceptible to PTSD. And not only the photographers, but I was at a symposium a few weeks ago. AP has people who just sit there all day long, citizen photographs, photographs taken with cell phones, are such a huge component of photojournalism world now. They have people who just sit at the computer all day and look at these pictures that come in and decide whether they're going to pass any on to the editors. But they were finding that most of those pictures, especially now with Syria and stuff going on, were getting to those people. So those people now, they rotate. They only, they only do that two days a week or something. And they have to rotate it to try to, because our mind just doesn't want to acknowledge this capacity of human beings to kill each other in so many varied ways. So this is a very famous photograph um, that McCollum took of a man with shell shock and Nina Berman's photograph of a, of a more contemporary Iraq soldier. Um, Battlefield Dead were the earliest photographs that could be taken other than portraits because it was safe. If you, if you were a photographer on the winning side, it was safe to go in and make those pictures. Um, what was fascinating for me was looking at pictures like this with the military historians and having them say, oh, let's see, they were over here, so the confluence of bullets was coming from this direction. And listening to them dissect these photographs from a military point of view, which was totally not something any of us would have thought about or, or, or cared about, um, they are nice. Um, truly daunting picture um, of taking of a key bridge um, in Baghdad. Um, sometimes um, battlefield death is, or death in, in conflict is, is conveyed in this where there is, um, you know, multiple deaths. And sometimes photographers just let one stand for the multitude. And, um, you know, there are a lot of single pictures that, that just represent that. Um, civilian death, this is a soldier's death um, that's going on. The destruction, um, that's a wooded area in uh, Belgium, um, the Chateau Wood, um, which is, you know, just totally eviscerated by the, they shelled for six days or something, and there's 
We're not talking about a surprise attack. The four that came up out of the trenches to, to charge. Um, and then this is Dresden, the bombing of Dresden, as you know. I think it was 300,000 or something like that who died in Dresden from the shelling. Um, and grief, it was really here interesting hearing the military historians talk about the military trying to deal with grief. You know, it's something they need the men and the women to recover and um, maybe go right back into battle. And so they have found that ceremony is absolutely critical. So I'm sure you all have seen those pictures from recent wars of the gun with the helmet on it and the boots. Um, and then they, they have those ceremonies for the living, really, um, to try to deal with and, and acknowledge and cope with their grief. Uh, so this is a burial at sea in the Navy. And this is a photograph where a comrade is trying to cover him, and this man is counting dog tags and, and just you know, making an official record of, of the people who have died. Um, prisoners, um, Vietnam, Iraq, um, you know, it's a major component. Their pictures rarely published at the time. really complicated, and I certainly don't have the answers which pictures are published and which aren't. Um, newspapers and magazines and even the internet don't tend to put up the pictures of what goes on that we at home don't want to acknowledge. Um, and so pictures of prisoners are something that they are often not published unless they're part of a photo <coughs> essay. Um, uh, on the extended series. Now one of the things people at the home front do want to see the most is they want to see their loved ones being like they remembered them, doing human things that they can acknowledge, um, that they can identify with. Um, this is a wonderful picture from World War I where he's put on a gas mask to peel an inch. Um, <laughs> And one of the things we tried as much as possible to do is um, not just have it to be um, a United States perspective. We wanted photographs from both sides as much as we could get them. And we knew there were wonderful photographers on the North Vietnamese side. So um, we had seen some of them published in various sources. And we just kept trying to find them in North Vietnam. And finally, we found a man in Australia who put us together um, with a man in Ho Chi Minh City who said he would get back to us. And the next thing I know, this is one of the pictures we were looking for, which is North Vietnamese soldiers reading their mail, taking a break. Um, I got this email, dear Ms. Tucker, I, I am uh, the daughter of um, Dong Quan Kin. We are very honored that you want to put my father's photograph in your exhibition. I live in Houston and I'm a member of the Fine Arts Houston. <laughs> and I can tell you how many emails have gone out trying to find this person. And we have a very large Vietnamese community in Houston. And, um, she has an architectural pra uh, practice. Um, so, um, and then um, another other picture is women soldiers in the Israeli army. Um, a woman soldier told me that this is not allowed anymore. Soldiers may not post um, photographs of nude in their borders anymore. It's part of the Army's initiative to deal with sexual harassment. Because um, I was going through the exhibition with a, a female medic from um, Iraq, and boy, she walked out of that she said, when was that taken? And then she said, oh, the policy wasn't in effect. So um, apparently that's not um, allowed anymore. And I think of all that nose con art in World War II and everything, but this is um, part of the sexual harassment um, effort. That's what I'm going to say, not quite as vigilant as it might be in the military to deal with sexual harassment. Um, medical, this is one of my favorite pictures, another by a North Vietnamese photographer of um, a, a surgery actually being performed in a swamp. Um, 
Now, another one of the great privileges for me was meeting a 23-year um, Army um, doctor who um, had uh, been in Somalia and Iraq and, and et cetera. And he just took me through the stages of you have battlefield injury, where the medic goes out, medic is the most dangerous profession, more dangerous than actually the combatant um, in the military because the enemy knows if they kill a medic, they kill two people. Um, then if they can get them out, um, then they bring them to a, an area where they can uh, evaluate them, put some bandages on, maybe stabilize them, and then get them further back into a mass unit. Um, many of you may have seen the TBC series MASH. So I asked this doctor how true MASH was. And he said, it's actually, there's a lot of truth. They did their homework for that. MASH stands for mobile unit. Um, they still have them. Now they're not tense like they were in the television series, but they are actually physical structures that are carried by helicopters, but taken to approximate areas near anticipated battlefields. Um, but he said, I said, well, what about the constant drinking? And he said, not so much. He said, but in Somalia, we operated for 23 hours straight. We just stood there and operated. Our guys, enemies, civilians, whoever they put on the table, we operated on. And he said, when that was over, um, we threw a bash that could have gotten every single one of us court-martialed, but the Army just put a blind eye to it because they knew what we had just been through. Um, but the other thing that I was fascinated about in, in researching the medical section is the benefits for all of us. Plastic surgery comes from World War I. Um, they, because, um, as artillery ramps up in its power, um, the destruction to the human body ramps up, and so the need for um, uh, prosthesis and, and plastic surgery and ether and all kinds of things come to us because of the needs of the military, as does the revolution in prosthetics. Um, prosthetic was another huge pattern in the exhibition with somebody in uniform, he's not, but if somebody in uniform with prosthetic, you don't need a caption. You know, that is a self-explaining picture. And so it's one that photographers go after time and again. This is an Iraq veteran with a prosthetic leg who's playing Star Wars um, with his kids. And it's actually been one of the most, another one of the most commented on pictures in the exhibition because that whole thing of children playing war you know, relative to this situation of their father. Um, this is where they're playing cards in the operating room, um, and they're using the patient's uh, chest. Um, you know, they're waiting, they're waiting for, to operate on him. And, um, um, faith um, is used, the old saying, there's no atheist in talk shows. Um, uh, Alexander was the first military leader to initiate chaplains. There have been chaplains in military um, ever since ancient times. Um, and um, Gene Smith made this ironic picture of photographing um, an altar that had been set up for Sunday morning services on the aircraft carrier, but positioning himself so he got the kill marks of the planes shot down by that aircraft carrier. Um, you know, uh, as part of the picture. This is a Muslim photograph where this is the man's compressor and he put the bloody hand on it, going back to biblical times now, in order to hope that it would protect his compressor from the conflict. Um, refugees was a huge issue. One of the categories that the military historians changed was we had a category called home front. And they said, that's only America. You're sitting at home, like they are, and you're waiting for war news. He said, for most people in the world now, um, it's their living room that is the front of the war. Um, and so um, we had a, a section to acknowledge, and, and also statistically, 
I'm not good at hearing numbers, but the number of soldier to civilian death has gone from, you know, soldiers being war to civilian being much greater now in most modern conflicts. Um, what I love about this picture is you can play one of those games. How many pictures of soldiers are in this picture? Um, you know, it's like one of those newspaper games because he's captured the fact that they're at home, but they have all these soldiers who are stationed, you know, somewhere during the war. Um, the other thing about civilians is starvation. Um, how this man is walking, this walking skeleton, I have no idea. Um, but, um, you know, we just wanted people to be aware, and then civilian death. This is a Bosnian woman who's going through body bags, um, looking for a piece of cloth or a piece of jewelry or anything to, to identify loved ones exhumed from a mass grave. This is in Somalia, and the soccer field has been turned into a cemetery, and he is digging his daughter's grave. Um, children was another section. Huge research now of the effect of war on children and of seeing war. There are more, um, the biggest studies have been done about children who were involved in the Central American Wars, and they're more inclined to get into gang wars, to get into gangs. They're, Nerd of, 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 of uh, uh, and then child soldiers, is, you know, they've been child soldiers forever and I'm afraid will continue to be. Um, then the, the um, victory and defeat, when you talk about the Joe Rosenthal photograph, um, this is just from February to May. It's already so famous that this photographer has these Russian flags made for him in Moscow before coming to Berlin with his own idea of making a Joe Rosenthal-like photograph in Berlin, and he chose the Reichstag, the German parliament, and to, to photograph um, these men. Now, the controversy around this picture is there are two watches, and this version of the picture um, on that man's wrist, and that's looting. And Toss made him touch out the second watch, you know. But the photographer was interviewed by a friend of mine, and they were in his small Moscow apartment, and there were stacks of photographs and boxes, and he asked him about touching out the watch. And the photographer jumped up, and he just started pulling photographs out of boxes of people dead in the snow until the whole apartment, he said the whole apartment was like it was covered with snow and dead bodies in the snow. And these were Russians killed by the retreating Germans. And then the photographer turned around and he said, don't talk to me about watches. Um, now when I talk about you can't, every photograph is different and it may not be what you think it is. We all, this is such, seemingly such an obvious photograph of this. Um, he was in the Hanau Hilton, he was a prisoner. He was one of the last released. Um, he's coming home, um, his family, the photographer took the picture, talks about the family breaking through the lines and running toward him as he came off the plane. Um, what you don't know in this picture is that from Vietnam, his plane landed in Guam and then came home. He received a letter from his wife. He'd been gone for 10 years. He received a letter from his wife telling him she was divorcing him. She had already started divorce proceedings when he was finally free. Um, so you have to be careful about thinking you know what a picture is about um, because very often there's a backstory. Um, and then you get into the ideas of remembrance. And um, some of them are taken quite close to war. This is where um, Jim Goldberg photographed people in the Dem Democratic Republic of Con Congo. He photographed them with their injuries, and then he let them write on the photograph their version of the story. So it becomes a collaboration between Jim and the person photographed. Um, in looking at a million pictures, we never once saw a picture of rape, and we looked, 
and we ask in archives. Um, rape goes back, if you think about the rape of Europa, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a tactic of war. Military historians talk about it as a tactic of war. Um, and um, I have talked, I, when we interviewed photographers, we interviewed tons of photographers, and they said it was complicated. Even if they saw such an, an, a moment, one, they were unarmed and the person during the rape was rarely alone and was, if people with him were armed. Two, they felt it became an additional violation of the woman. And three, as men, they felt they should be stopping it, but of course there was no way they could. So it was really, they were clearly conflicted. Jonathan de Gorbik was so conflicted that he went back to Rwanda. In Rwanda, the Hutu intentionally raped the Tutsi, trying to wipe out the Tutsi tribe. And so he went back, made a series called Intended Consequences, photographing the women who had children born of rape. Now, their tribes didn't want them back. If they would leave their child of the Hutu, they could come back to their tribe. But um, they could not bring their child to rape. So as mothers, some of them did, some of them abandoned their children, and others did not. This is um, one child by her husband whom she saw killed in front of her, and one from the rape. What happened with this series is when the book came out, so much money, came in to the publishing house, they have now been able to set up microeconomic teachers for these women and, and help them get cows. He said there was one, and these women have now formed their own villages, and there was one that had a cow, and then the next time he went back, they also had two goats, you know, and, and so it, it is the power of photography. Um, um, Elegay, these are pictures that end our exhibition, um, and they are the, this is four of the five D-Day beaches, and when I talk to veterans of World War II, they like these pictures because for them, <coughs> it's not about them, it's not about the survivors, it's about the people who didn't leave the beach. And so the, the Elegay quality of these pictures, um, and then, Two pictures from this exhibition, um, because we came to two conclusions. One is that war is within us as human beings. Um, it, there's just no other, I can draw no other conclusion. And the other is that war is never in. I don't care if there is a defeat date. Um, our father's war is our war, our wars are our children's wars. We interviewed lots of children and veterans and um, how it affected their lives. Um, you know, I grew up in the South, and I grew up with my grandmother telling me Civil War stories. Um, and that's kind of holding on a long time. Um, but it's about trying to come to terms with this incredible event that affected your life, or your family's life, or your culture's life. Um, and and we, um, we really came to respect that. So, um, I've talked for a long time, I'm sorry, but it is 155 years. Um, so, thank you very much.